Well, if you're not aware, we have officially begun the long-awaited time in one of the books, actually the final book of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, I personally am so excited to, to start this. I don't know how long it will take, but um, what's the rush? And I hope that you're excited as I am because this is really a precious book. And so why don't you just open your Bibles and meet me right there in chapter 1 of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1. The title Deuteronomy simply means second law. Second law. And the title reflects greatly upon the purpose of this book. The purpose of this book is simply this. That God had given Moses a series of messages that would essentially repeat and expand upon what we just read throughout these years, the books that are sitting in front of this one. And so what we realize is that this is really a repetition of what we have read already. And you probably realize that as you've read the book of Deuteronomy. Now there's a reason behind the repetition. It's because there's a specific audience behind this book. As we know and as we've concluded before we, we went into that series of doctrine concerning the Trinity and the deity of Christ, the last thing that we found out was the initial generation that came out of the nation of Egypt to be brought into the promised land, what happened to them? They have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years only to die and for them to experience a mass funeral. And what we have at this point now is those are those who were children to the first adult generation, now all grown up, and are literally at the threshold, are the right, they are right at the border going into the promised land. And these once children heard the law at one point where, anybody know where they heard it? Mount of Horeb. Yeah, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, as little kids, as teenagers heard the law, but they are in need of a repetition. They are in need to renew their understanding and to renew their covenant with God right before they take their first steps into what God had so long to bring his people into. And so this is the essence of the book of Deuteronomy. But this book is special in different ways as well. It's divided into three speeches. So if you're taking notes, this is, this is a good point to, to write down. Between chapters 1 and 4, we have the first speech. Between chapters 5 and 26, you have Moses' second speech. And between chapters 27 and 34, you have Moses' third speech. You can almost say that they are a series of sermons. Now, that's one way to divide a book. And there's another way to divide the book. And it is by three directions. So not just three speeches, but three directions. So the first direction is that between chapters 1 and 11, you have Moses having the people of Israel look back. Look back specifically to the 40-year wilderness journey and to draw out the principles and lessons and commands and promises from God. And from that place, you have a second direction between chapters 12 and 31, which is to look up. And he wants the people of God to look up to God and to realize the commands that God is, has given them and is giving them. And then you have the final direction in the final two chapters, which deals with looking forward looking forward, looking to what God will do and what God wants to do and the promises ahead for this people. So you can divide it either one of those ways. Looking backward, the 40-year wilderness journey, we're going to see that in our time in the first portion of this book. Looking upward, the commands of God in detail expanded upon what we've learned from Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And finally looking forward to what God wants to do. And here's a good principle just from the division of the book. That's a good way to live life in our relationship with God. It's healthy to look back, not to dwell in the past, not to be crippled. Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So we don't look back in our past mistakes and allow that to paralyze us in fear of the future or the present. Nor do we look back to the past victories and say, oh, look how awesome I am. Look what I've done for God. But there is a healthy way of looking back in thankfulness of God's faithfulness, of God's word, of God's dealings with us. And obviously, it's always good to look up, to look unto Jesus, to look upon his word, to look upon him in prayer, to seek him, to ask him to reveal himself more and more throughout this journey. And surely it is also healthy and necessary to look forward, 
to believe God for more, to look at the promises, to look heavenward, to keep our minds on the things above and not on the things on this world. So we must continually walk with those directions in mind from the heart. And this will propel us and this will frame us to experience the fullness of what God has for us. And that's what Moses is essentially doing. Moses here, the theme of this book is remembrance and renewal. Remembering what God has done, his faithfulness, his commands, his promises, his standards, his dealings, his discipline, his kindness. And as a result, now visualize this with me. You have an entire fresh breed of Israelites that are excited, eager, about to burst out, ready to step out of what they've been in for so many years into what God wants them to go into. And you have Moses here now preaching a sermon and this is Moses' wisdom, which is obviously God's wisdom, to stir them by remembering in order that they would walk in greater faithfulness and eagerness with God in a new land. That's what's happening. So visualize that. That's what this whole book is. You have a people that are listening to a very long series of sermons to bless their hearts and their obedience to God. And as said before, if you've read this book, perhaps you've been challenged by its repetitive nature. Like, okay, I've seen this, I've read this, I've seen this in Exodus, I've seen this in Numbers. Why, why, why are we reading this again? But that's not just limited to the book of Deuteronomy. That's, that's a lot of the books in the Bible. If you read First and Second Kings, guess what happens? Right next to it, First and Second Chronicles. And a lot of what you see in First and Second Kings reappears in First and Second Chronicles. Why didn't God give us one gospel account? Why do we have four? A lot of similarities between those four gospel accounts. And here's one reason why. Because God had instituted that a testimony is solidified by two or three witnesses. We have four gospel accounts to testify to the truth of who Jesus is. But why repeat so many stories and parables? Why, even when you read the epistles, you see Paul saying very similar things in different letters to different churches. Here's why. Because God in his wisdom recognizes our need to hear repeated truths. You know, every page of this book could, be a, could have been a fresh, unique set of revelation. And that's partly true. There is something to learn from every page of this book. But God sees the need. God realizes that we are in need, that as we scale through this Bible, we will be faced with similar truths in order for it to be solidified in our souls. And so that's what we see in the book of Deuteronomy. That's what we see in various books of the Bible. Nevertheless, even though you and I face repeated truths in the Bible, like Deuteronomy, this book not only repeats, it expands. And so there are fresh jewels, there are golden nuggets hidden in there, even the things that seem so similar that require special attention, a little bit of patience to dig, to compare, and then ultimately reap the reward for. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take our time going through this book. But again, there's so many other things to say about this book that is so special. Deuteronomy is often the book that the prophets point to in their preaching when calling the nation to repentance. Oftentimes when they're calling the people to go back to the law, what they have in mind is the book of Deuteronomy. Because the book of Deuteronomy serves as like the constitution of the nation. The book of Deuteronomy serves as the official book, so to speak, of the law of the land. And oftentimes what we see in those books where the prophets are calling the people to repentance, what they're really saying is you broke what you promised in that covenant made with God in Deuteronomy. You were unfaithful. And the book of Deuteronomy actually explains the exiles that the nation experiences because it warns of exile in this book as an ultimate consequence to the sin of the people. The book of Deuteronomy also is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. Top four. Deuteronomy is one of them. What are the other three, just for the sake of knowing? Psalms, Psalms definitely. Isaiah. Isaiah, yes. And one more. Somebody says something. Genesis. Genesis. Yes, you're right. Those are the first top four books that are quoted in the New Testament. Not only that, go to Matthew chapter 4 very quickly. Matthew chapter 4. This is the temptation account. What do we see here in verse 4? Jesus answering, Satan. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Where do you think that's quoted from? Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. What do we see here? 
In verse 7, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Where's that from? Six where? What verse? 16. And what do we see here finally? In verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Deuteronomy 6, 13. Jesus utilized Deuteronomy. Jesus extracted from Deuteronomy to actually fight against temptation. Now let's be honest with us. I'll be honest. I don't think of going to the book of Deuteronomy as a means of memorization to find ways to fight against temptation. Jesus did though. But it goes even deeper than that. Go to Deuteronomy 17 and realize the implication of what Jesus is doing here. Deuteronomy 17. Look at verse 18. This was the rule in this book in this book being written and sealed for generations to come, this book was also given for the kings that would rule in the nation. And look at the rule for the king concerning how they relate to this book. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law. So whoever would be king would have to take the book of Deuteronomy and write his own handwritten copy. If you want to be king, you got to take this book, write it out for yourself. That would be a fun challenge, wouldn't it? Just to see how long that would take. If you're up for it, let me know. I would like to know. I want to record it and see how long it takes. Approved by the Levitical priest, verse 19. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Have you ever realized, reading First and Second Kings, why so many are going up and down in their reign? Here's one reason. They didn't obey this. They did not obey this. In fact, we see Josiah and his reform when he sends people to clean the temple. They find the book of this law. They bring it back. They go, what is this? They don't even recognize the thing. And then when they read it, they realize, no wonder why we are being judged by God and a revival breaks out. But Jesus knew the book of Deuteronomy. And Jesus, by quoting the book of Deuteronomy, is proving something about his nature and his calling. That when first and second kings, all the people that were in leadership positions continually failed by failing to obey this rule, Jesus obeyed it perfectly, proving that he's the perfect king. You see? So by quoting Deuteronomy, he's proving something. I'm the perfect king who perfectly knows the book of this law, where all the leaders and the kings in the past have continually failed to do so. Isn't that powerful? So, so many reasons why the book of Deuteronomy is a precious book. And not just for those reasons, but for the practical reasons as well. I like to think in an imaginative way that we are all, perhaps, standing at the threshold of the promised land. The promised land is, in some context, a picture of heaven. But it is more so a picture of God's perfect will for our lives. His unreserved blessings. His desire for us to abide in and to inherit what He had purchased for us. And the reality is, many believers are like the Israelites from the first generation. In what way? That they wander in their lives, never attaining what God wants them to attain. And ultimately dying and missing out on what God had planned for their lives. But then there are others, like us, if we are still alive, that have the opportunity to reap the most out of what God has for you and me. To drink from the rivers of milk and honey in the spiritual sense. But it will require what it required this fresh breed of Israelites. A willingness to listen, a willingness to remember, and a willingness to make a covenant with God that I will walk in your ways. Salvation is free, praise be to God. But you and I experiencing the fullness of what he has for us in this life is not free. It will cost us all something. And it will cost them something. And we're going to discover they're willing to pay the price. And as we hear these truths, we got to be willing to make the decision. Am I going to respond faithfully to what God has for me? Or am I going to wander in this life in a circle and die out missing out what God has for me? So we see in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 1. Let's read this together. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness... 
in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazroth, and Dizahab. So right there we know where they are. Locally they are positioned right before the land. They are about to cross the River Jordan and they are there hearing what Moses has to say. And this is a beautiful thing as we visualize it. But then it goes into verse 2 to tell us something interesting right off the get-go. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. It just wants to tell us how long it takes from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. And it says 11 days. Now we heard, where's Horeb? Or what is Horeb? Yeah, it's a synonymous word, synonymous term for Mount Sinai, Exodus 19. So from that place to Kadesh Barnea, and according to Numbers 13, we realize that Kadesh Barnea is actually where the Israelites were planted before sending the 12 spies to go out and to check out the land. It's actually technically the border of the land of Canaan. And what the author is saying is between Mount Seir, or Sinai rather, and Kadesh Barnea was an 11-day journey. Now, why does the author want to mention this right from the beginning? Why is that even important? Because originally it should have took 11 days, not 40 years. Exactly. What should have taken 11 days between Sinai, the covenant that was made, and going to where God wanted to go, should have taken a little under two weeks, but in fact it took them 38 years. Disobedience will always cause a sense of delay to God's blessing and promise. Always. If we willfully disobey what God had clearly given to us, we will not experience. In fact, we will delay in what God wants us to know in terms of his blessing and promise. That's always the sense when somebody lives out in an extensive season of time where they are not walking with the Lord. When they come back, there is always this sense of I've missed out, I've wasted time. Now, what's amazing about God is that he can revive and renew that time. But let's not live with that kind of mentality. Let's live with the desire and the hope that I'm going to extract the most out of every single day. And I'm not going to disobey and miss out on even a moment of what God wants to have for me in this life. If you're still breathing in this place, do not live with the guilt that you've missed out. You didn't die in the wilderness. There's still hope and there's still a plan. But this is what the author wants us to know. And we all have the same choice with our relationship with God. Please hear me on this. We have the choice to be wanderers. We have the choice to circle around the wilderness. Or we have the choice to take step by step, getting closer and closer to what God has for us. Everybody has that choice for themselves. One generation missed out. This generation is hearing that to be reminded to not make the same mistake. You know why? Because it was in the very same place that they are standing now that their parents stood and disobeyed and went into reverse mode. So they're hearing this, and they're realizing, okay, our parents were here. Let's not make the same mistake they did. Let's actually obey. When he says go, we're going to go. When he says stop, we're going to stop. We want to make it to what he has for us. Then we read in verse 5. We're not going verse by verse here. But let's go to verse 5, and let's see what it says. Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law saying. I love that. You know why? Because Moses knows he's not going into the promised land. Moses, in fact, is giving his final message to his people. Moses is about to be taken off the scene forever. And what did Moses as a leader choose to do to invest in his people for the final time? He undertook to explain this law. Moses realized the value and the benefit and the eternal fruit that would come from investing in his people by explaining the word of God, by pouring into what God had given to him into the hearts of his people. Because this is the truth and this is the power of the word of God. That when your leaders are out of the scene, guess what remains? God's word. That when, when, when somebody else is taken up in charge and, and there's a transition in life, There's something else that is an anchor to your soul, and it's the truth of God's word. And Moses exemplifies what a leader truly does in the spiritual sense. Takes the time to explain the word of God to his people, because he knows that even when he's removed, something else remains. God's promises, God's word, God's character and nature instilled, poured into, and hopefully received by those who would hear. He undertook to explain this law 
And at this point, Moses is about to take his people down a trip through memory lane. As we learn, the first portion of this book, Moses is now going to say, okay, guys, we're going to take a flashback and we're going to remind ourselves of key events through that 40-year wilderness journey for a reason. And here's the reason. That again, you would hear and know what God has done, who God is, and how you can either experience what he wants you to experience or forfeit what he wants you to experience. And he starts in verse 6. The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. So the Israelites were at that mountain. And what happened at that mountain? God manifested himself in such a powerful way. And God revealed himself concerning his laws and his expectations from the people. And they made a covenant. So at Mount Sinai was a period, a season of time of revelation and manifestation. And in fact, they were there. Does anybody know how long they were at Mount Sinai? We read it and it seems like 15 minutes, but it was actually one year. They were there for one year. And after that one year, God says, it's enough, time to move on. Mount Sinai was not a place of permanence for the people of Israel. They were to move from that place. And again, here's the principle for you and me concerning our relationship with God. That there are seasons in our life where we experience a revelation of God, a manifestation of God. But God desires for us to move from that place to greater things. You've stayed at this mountain long enough. Time to move on. Many of us might be sitting on the same truths that we knew so long ago and have no desire to move on from those truths. Many of us have known something of God or experienced God in a very special way like they did but are staying in that place, not realizing that there is greater things ahead if we were to just go and believe it. And I love how it's one year. I don't believe this is the reason why it was one year, but it's just, it's funny how it works. That's how we measure our schooling system in terms of our education. That we go from one year to the next, and that measures our growth, and that measures our knowledge, and that measures how we are advancing in our understanding of general truths in life. And here's a wonderful thing. Let's apply that in a spiritual sense. All of us today. Have I moved on, spiritually speaking? Have I grown? Have I understood more? Have I been stretched? Have I been challenged more than I was last year? See, you can get, you can get 100% on the same test and still stay in the same grade, Right? You can, you can understand the same truths and still be at the same level, but God wants us to grow. God wants us to increase. God wants us to move forward. Not to, not to despise or reject those elementary truths, but to continue to believe that there is greater things. And we have to all ask that question, where am I today? It's possible to be saved for 15 years and still be in the same level as you were when you first got saved. It's everywhere. But it's not God's will. And so from this one verse, we can hear something for ourselves You've stayed here long enough, my son. You've stayed here long enough, my daughter. Believe that you have something more to explore in me. And that's what he says here. Look, verse 8. See, I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. So he says, see, I want you to see. I want you to realize there is more. There is more. As glorious as Mount Sinai was, as glorious as these truths are, it's now time to walk it out. It's now time to walk in greater experience. It's now time to see me move in your life in a greater way. So go in and take possession. So we're all invited to move on, but he's not going to force us. We got to believe. We got to hunger. We got to get these feet moving, and then he'll walk with us. And then he'll reveal more and more as we take steps. But we have to make the choice. And this is the first truth for these Israelites of this fresh generation. By hearing this, you know what they're realizing? God has more. God has more. And we got to believe that for ourselves as well. God has more. I'm not going to stick around here in the same place. I'm not going to not challenge myself. I'm not going to demand and ask of myself to hunger for the things of God in a greater way. Now we move on to the second truth. And there are many truths, but just for the sake of this study. Now Moses wants to recall how they grew in number and how he had to, because of the burden, find other leaders to be raised up. 
That's what we see from verse 9 down to verse 18. And this is what it says in verse 9. At that time, I said to you, I'm not able to bear you by myself. You guys are just, there's too much of you. There's too many of you and there's too many problems. The Lord your God has multiplied you and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. When it comes to growth, in the physical sense with numbers, by nature, by default, so also arises the potential for issues, for problems, for conflicts. That just comes with growth. You know, some people are scared of growth because of that. There needs to be new roles filled in. There needs to be new responsibilities. There needs to be new ministries. There needs to be new care, new attention, more energy taken out from us. Sometimes we get comfortable with where we're at because we know that these things come with growth. But that's not what Moses' heart posture was. Look at verse 11. In realizing that there is burden that comes with growth, look what he says. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. Because there's a beautiful thing about growth. That it's a testimony of how God is expanding and how God is investing, how God is moving. And Moses was not intimidated by that. Moses encouraged that, but he, knew, he wanted to give wisdom to know how to facilitate and manage that. And so he raises up leaders. His father-in-law had a role to play in that. And now he comes in and he, he gives a standard of who these leaders are supposed to be. They're supposed to be discerning. They're supposed to be experienced. They're supposed to be wise. And this is the lesson for the Israelites as they're hearing this. This is what they're hearing. Even as we go into the promised land, the centrality of God's will for our lives, there's still the possibility for conflict. There's still the possibility for attention. There's still the possibility for problems to arise. And that's true for any growth, for a church, for a small group, whatever, whatever you want to call it, whatever ministry it is, that we have to believe that too. We, we shouldn't be unaware of that, but it's not God's desire. God's desire is for us to be in harmony. And the way God has instituted it, both for the Israelites and for the church is that he has raised up leaders. He has raised up people. He has raised up guys like Lurkan who bring water. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And so the idea here is that he's, he's reminding them of what was instituted and that they would take those things going into the promised land for themselves. And look, what, look, at, look at what it says here in verse 12. This is the people's responsibility. Verse 12 it says, How can I bear by myself the weight of burden of you and your strife? Okay, so as the people, this is a reminder to them. It's kind of a check in their, in their own hearts. Don't be a burden and don't cause strife. We should be a people that when we enter into a community, we are light, we're not heavy. That we bring peace, that we bring harmony, that we bring something of service, something of contribution. Uh, that Not that we do the opposite. And strife. We don't want to be a people of strife. Things happen because we're humans, so God raises up leaders, and this is what the leaders were supposed to do in verse 16. Verse 16 says this. And I charge your judges at that time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with you. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment is God's. So the leader's role is to judge righteously, is to not show favoritism, is to take things at God's word, not based on who you are, how much money you bring to the church. What kind of service you bring to the ministries? What kind of status you have in society? You might be thinking, what are you talking about? I'm telling you that people rule ministries this way. That's what I'm saying. That people make judgments based on who they are. James warns about that kind of favoritism in ministry. To judge righteously and in the fear of God, not to be intimidated by anyone, not to let anybody push you around in your judgment, in your discernment, in how you deal with situations because ultimately God is the judge and he will judge the judges and so walk in the fear of the Lord now when we have these combinations when we have this mutual submission we can experience longevity in the promised land corporately this is the lesson that Moses is giving go in with this understanding that God has raised up leaders as a way to sustain what God wants you to experience now we scroll down to verse 26 and 28. And this is where Moses recounts where things went sour with the first generation, 
where things went downhill. And from 19 down to verse 25, he retells the story almost exact to how we read it in Numbers. But now we read it again in reminder to how the first generation thought, where they messed it all up. This is where it happened. He says in verse 26, Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us. Can you imagine? Because the Lord hated us, He has brought us out of the land of Egypt. All of that, guys, according to these Israelites, all of that deliverance, all of the plagues, all of the provision was God hating them. To give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. This was the attitude that severed the possibility for these guys to move forward into what God wanted them to move forward in. And guess what? Could you actually believe that what made them miss out could be the reason why we miss out? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that this was given to us as an example. This was given to us to be warned. So what do you, as you read this, this is Bible study, what do we read out of there as the reason for them missing out in terms of how they responded? Because ultimately... It's unbelief, right? All sin is rooted in unbelief. When you and I choose to sin against God, when you and I choose to go against the command of God, you know what we're really saying? God, I don't believe you. God, I don't trust you, so I'm going to do this instead. It's all rooted in unbelief and pride, but unbelief is mingled with that for sure. But what do we see in their response to God and his dealings with them? What are they saying about God's character? This generation, you delivered us out of Egypt, but now you're hating us, so it's going against the idea of God's being the same. Yeah, so this is a reflection on what the first generation said. Moses is recollecting here. And so what the first generation thought essentially was that God and his leadership for us is really not for our good. That's what they're trying to say. By saying that he's let us out because he's hated us, is an attack on his motive of his leadership for them. God, you're really not for me. You're actually against me. God, you're really not in this for my good. You're in this for your pleasure at the expense of my pain, my discomfort, my unfortunate circumstances. Isn't it amazing how that when you and I face something that is not necessarily going our way, we tend to forget all the good that God has done and focus on the negative. That's what they're doing. They're faced with the challenges of these giants and they forget. It all leaks out. It just comes out. They don't think about what he's done and all they're focused with, all they're caught up with is the negative and all what God is not doing. That's how we are. That's our nature. That's our hearts. It's so true. We almost collapse when things are overwhelming, when a situation is before us and we can't calculate how it's going to work out and we eclipse all the good that God has done. It's not in our language. It's not in our counsel. And when we talk and we confess and we vent, it's only about what God is not doing and how this is, I don't know how this is going to go about. And, and we murmur and we complain and we ultimately say, God's not really for me. Not just that. Verse 28 says, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are fortified, are great and fortified up to heaven. So the second thing that they did was, not only did they come up with this idea that God was not for their good and his leadership, but that God is not able to change the circumstance with the situation that is before us. That the promises of God cannot be fulfilled because we are faced with something that is almost impossible to solve. And that's how we also look at things as well. We, we are faced with situations and we are discouraged to obey because we don't know how obeying is actually going to overcome the situation that's before us. So we're dishonest with our money 
Because if I'm honest with our money, I don't know how my honesty to money is going to make this overcome. I got to do some tricks. I got to make things happen my way to, to make this situation better. And we can fill in the blank, whatever those situations are, where we look at the commands of God and how simple and plain they are. We look at the situation, we go, how does moving forward into the promised land going to solve all these giants? So I'm going to do it my way. And thank you, God, but you don't know what you see. And I, I, I get it. And we do it our way and ultimately it turns back on us. Does that make sense? This is what ultimately eliminated their chance to go in. It was not a one-time thing. It was a buildup of so many things, and it climaxed here. So they were attacking God's nature, and they were attacking God's ability. God, you hate us, and God, you're not able to do anything about this. And God says, you don't believe me. Enough is enough. Go back towards the Red Sea. This must have been traumatizing. And it was, because they responded to, okay, God, we're going to go forward. And they go forward, and we know what happens then. But look at what happens here. So you have, you have these guys, these spies that come in, and it says, our brothers made our hearts melt. I remember reading that thing to myself. Wow, as a brother, I have the potential of making my other brothers and sisters' hearts melt. I can either build up my brothers or sisters in faith, or I can be the very reason why they don't move on in faith. And not only that, this is the general principle. You and I should be very careful of what voices we allow to speak into our hearts. And I'm not just talking about who you hang out with. I'm talking about all avenues of voice. I'm not going to listen to things that are not going to build my faith. I'm not going to watch things that are not going to build my faith. I'm not going to let anything come into these ears that would make me not love God, believe God, want God more. My flesh is enough of a battle for me. I don't need other things contributing to my flesh. I need things to build me up. I need things to stir my faith. I need things to... Get my affections up again for the Lord. That's what I need. That's what you and I need. We need to be very careful of the voices that we allow to speak into our hearts that would make our faith melt and not be built up. That's a good way of analyzing what we allow to be spoken into our lives. And it's not just when I have conversations. There are many voices out there that are trying to get in here and in here. Moses is the other voice. Verse 29, then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. I love verse 31. This, when you and I see this, this is incredible. It says here, and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you. Carried you as a man carries his son. Isn't that precious? This is how God described his relationship with them through the wilderness. So you visualize a son in the arms, in the bosom of his father. And right there we understand that this speaks of love. This speaks of protection. This speaks of guidance. This is how God carried them. And you know what's amazing? Moses echoed this. Back in Numbers 11, you can write this down or turn there, but listen to what Moses said when he got so frustrated with the people of Israel. He says something very similar in Numbers 11:12. 12. Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, he's talking to God, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Doesn't that sound just exactly what he's saying here? And you know what that tells me? tells me this, that as amazing as a leader Moses was, even he could not live up to the love, protection, and guidance that God offers. Nobody is like him. Nobody will navigate life for you like him. Put all your trust in him. Moses, as wonderful as he was, could not live up to the standard and to the power, to the care and the compassion that God possesses. He goes, I can't do this. That's right, you can't. Only I can do this. And he does. This is another thing to realize too. God says, I've carried you like a father carries his son throughout the whole wilderness journey. Now think about this. What was the wilderness journey like? Was it smooth sailing? 
free from trials, free from testing, free from tribulation. Was, was any of that in the wilderness? No. We see times of testing. We see times of trials. We see times where their faith needed to be implemented. But all the while, he was holding them. He didn't drop them in those moments and say, figure it out and I'll pick you up when you're ready. The whole time God was holding them, even through all those episodes, why? It, it shows us this, that God didn't abandon them. God was with them the whole time, carrying them in those moments. Even though they couldn't feel it, even though they couldn't sense it, truth remains and prevails over feelings. God was holding them and protecting them and guiding them and loving them through all of that. So it is with you and I. When we come to the waters of Meribah and we don't see how this is going to work, when we come to the point where we don't have food and we need something to be coming from heaven, the whole time, never read Exodus and Numbers the same way again based on this word. God was holding him as a father holds his son through every single one of those episodes, through every single one of those seasons, God was there. We have to believe the same thing for ourselves. And we come finally to verse 36 and 38. He's recounting again the, the rebellion. And he wants to remind them of the first generation that passed away. How many were only left from that generation to go into the promised land? Two. Two out of the hundreds of thousands were going in. And Moses, as he's preaching this, you can imagine, you have all those new Israelites coming in. And then you have these two that are left from the wilderness journey that are standing there. And now Moses is going to use these two boys as a sermon illustration. They're no more, no more boys. They're men. And he says here, verse 35, Not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden. Why, Caleb? Why? Why, Caleb? Why, Caleb and Joshua? For this next part. Because he has wholly followed the Lord. Not partially, holy. Not seasonally, holy. And as he's telling this, guess who's hearing this? This new breed. And this is what they're understanding. If we're going to go in there and if our children and our children's children are going to stay there, we got to imitate these two guys. They wholly followed the Lord. What does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? I mean, this was what described their wholeness. That when an entire nation said, God hates us and God is not going to able to do this for us, they said, no, God is for us and God is able to do this for us. And when an entire nation turned their back, two stood. That's what it means to be wholly dedicated. What does it mean to be wholly dedicated? When everybody else wants to scatter and abandon, you stand firm. That's what it means to be holy. And guess what? God forbid it would be in this church. God forbid it would be in this church. But you and I have to make up our minds that even if our closest friends, like they had close friends and relatives that turned their backs on God, <laughs> though none go with me, still I will follow. That's what it means to wholly follow the Lord. Again, God forbid that you would experience the pain of seeing that with your own eyes. But we got to make up our minds and hearts from today that this is how we will live for Christ no matter what. So you have all these Israelites seeing a real life example of what it means to wholly follow the Lord. And guess what they're seeing? The blessing of it. The blessing of it. But look what he says about Joshua in verse 37. And even with me, the Lord was angry on your account. Just a reminder he's saying here. And said, you shall not go in there. Verse 38. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Look what Moses says. Look how precious this is. Look at this godly spiritual man. He says, encourage him. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. My heart was so warm when I read this verse. He says, Joshua, as your leader, he's going to take you in. He's going to guide you. He's going to lead you. He's going to pour into you. But leaders need encouragement too. And this is what, that's not the part that warmed my heart. This is the part that warmed my heart, that Moses said that. You know why that was so significant? Because Moses didn't experience it from his people. Moses as a leader experienced everything opposite of that. Continuous complaining, continuous murmuring, and he knew the value as a leader of what encouragement can do to his leadership. In fact, it was their complaining and their murmuring that caused them to get so angry that he sinned and missed out on the promised land. Do you remember when we talked about the power of encouragement? 
between Jonathan and David? Here's another insight, a negative one, how when somebody is called to lead doesn't receive encouragement, what it can actually do to his leadership. It crushed the man to the point where he himself missed out what God wanted him to experience. And so the one thing he says about this new young leader, he goes, make sure you encourage him because I didn't know it and I didn't experience it. And I know what it will do for him if you give it to him. And here's another question for us. Did the people listen? Did this generation, as a result of hearing this simple command, I mean, that's a simple command. You're talking about one little command in the midst of a huge sermon series. Did they listen? This shows how they listened to every single thing in this sermon series. Who thinks they listened? Who thinks they didn't listen? Who doesn't know? <laughs> Go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. The book that follows Deuteronomy. And we know chapter 1, how God encourages, how God pours into Joshua himself after verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan. So now, this is God's personal message to Joshua. And Moses is off the scene. He preached the sermon. He was taken up to glory. Joshua's left, and, and God pours into him. But the question was, did the people listen to Moses? And the answer is found in verse 16. And they, this is the people, they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we have obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. There it is. They listened. And how did they encourage him? They echoed what God said. God said be strong and courageous. And they said the very same thing. Best way to encourage is to take God's word, put it in your mouth, and speak it over somebody else's life. That's what they did. So we read this and we realize that Moses said encourage them, and they listened. They did it. And Joshua was a successful leader. Joshua was a strong leader. Joshua is one of those few in the Bible that made it from beginning to end. Joshua was one of those guys that when he was an assistant said, I will follow God when everybody was dancing around the golden calf. And you see at the end of his life, he said, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Could encouragement play a role in that? You could say it could have, definitely. I heard somebody once say this, that the, the, the church is the body. And he was talking about the different body parts. And he said, you know who are the fingernails of the church? The scratch the backs of other people? He goes, the encouragers. One little thing, one little thing that brings so much relief to somebody else. How true it is. If you have the gift of encouragement, you're a blessing. But guess what? You don't have to have the gift of encouragement. Everybody can be an encouragement. And you don't know what it can do to somebody else. It did great things for a young person who was called to leadership in the place of a man who did mighty things for God and he had big shoes to fill. Now we come to verse 42 as we close. He's talking about how after this, is, this uh, first generation failed to obey God, they wanted to change their minds. And it says, and the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up or fight. They're saying, we're going to go up. All right, God, we messed up. We understand. Get your swords and get your stuff. We're going up. Come on, guys. And so they get all the guys. They're ready to go up. And God says, oh, come on. Please don't do this now. It's over. And it says here, do not go up or fight. And here's the insight. For I am not in your midst. Lest you be defeated before your enemies. Profound. Was the promised land the will of God? Yes. But the promised land is not a possibility without God himself. God all has a desire for all of us. God wants us to walk in a specific work that he has set before us, before the foundation of the world. But guess what? If God doesn't go with us into that, it's not going to be possible. Even God's will is not possible apart from God's wisdom, leadership, guidance, and empowerment. And so if you and I are walking in God's will, if you and I are receiving and experiencing his blessing, none of us can boast. 
we can only say, yes, though I am in the center of God's will, apart from God bringing me here and keeping me here, I'm no good. And this is not a possibility. That's what we learn here. They go up and they try to enter the promised land, what God had promised from the beginning, what God desired. But because their hearts were not right with God, because their repentance was a worldly sorrow and not a godly one, God wasn't with them. God wasn't with them. And you and I must realize this, that we need God to experience God's blessing. We need God to do God's work. We need God to be where God wants us to be. We can't do it apart from him. We can't manipulate God's will and make it happen on our timing and our way. We need him to guide us step by step, to fight the giants along the way, and to trust that he will keep us there throughout that time. They learned that not just here, but later on. When they stayed in the promised land, they disobeyed. God removed his presence and the enemies came in. This is what we learned from Deuteronomy chapter 1. And there are many more lessons for us to learn from this book. But for now, this is the simple thing that we're going to do. Is ask God to bring us in the center of his will. And maybe just do what they're supposed to do at this point. That's remember. That song in the end was perfect. The bridge especially. I've seen you do it before, I know you'll do it again. You made a way before, I know that you'll make a way again. If you're experiencing a time of testing, of wondering, of knowing knowing what's what's next, trust that God is going to create such a testimony out of it that when you continue to walk in this life and are faced with the same challenges or even greater ones, you'll have a monument to look back to and say, God has done it before and he'll do it again. This is the God that we serve. A God that carries you like a father carries his son in his arms. I hope we believe that about our God in our lives today. He won't drop you. Even when it looks like he's not there, believe that whatever you're experiencing, he has a firm grip on your life. He has a firm grip on your mind. He has a firm grip on your emotions. He has a firm grip on your steps. Everything is in his hands. Everything. Right now. You're thinking, like, right now? Because I don't feel it. That's okay. They didn't feel it either. But eventually they saw it. And you know when you'll see it the most? When you come out of it on the other side. And you realize all those times, like, what is that footprints in the sand? It's the same idea. That those times where you see a couple of steps together and those times where you see only one step, it's like, where, where are the other set of steps? He was holding you. He was holding me. That's the idea. You and I will get glimpses of that in this life. We will ultimately, surely get a full panoramic view of it when we stand in glory and realize, oh, that's where you were, Lord. Oh, you were there the whole time. Oh, you kept me from going crazy at that point. Oh, you kept me from danger in that moment. Trust that and worship God in the midst of that because you know how you're worshiping God tonight? You're worshiping God as he's holding you in his arms. That's how we're worshiping tonight. Can we bow our heads and believe that together? Lord, we thank you for the truths found in this Old Testament book. And we realize how much of it is so new and fresh. And Lord, we don't know even where to begin in terms of meditating on the truths that we just heard. But surely one that sticks out as essential element of your character and nature is how you hold us. Thank you that the picture of you holding us is not this picture of freedom from issues and problems and conflicts and testing. No, that's evident. But what's also evident is your faithfulness, your protection, your wisdom. Lord, we don't choose to be like that first generation and say, God hates us. We choose to believe that you're for us. And Lord, we look at our situations that perhaps are filled with giants. It looks impossible. But Lord, we choose to believe that you can make it possible. And Lord, if you've brought us this far, you will bring us further still. Lord, we choose to worship you. We choose to worship you in the waiting.
Lord, these things are easier said than done. So we ask for the grace to be like Joshua and Caleb who wholly followed you. Lord, we don't want to look to the majority and say, if it happened to them, it's going to happen to us. We want to look at Caleb and Joshua as an example and say, if it's possible for them, then it's possible for me. So Lord, in this moment, in this Bible study, on this very night, we choose to meditate on these truths. Would you allow them to be deeply embedded in our souls? As you intended this book to work for this generation, do the same in us. Do the same in us. And Lord, we're thankful. Continue to guide us through this book and speak to us what you want to speak to us, that we may walk into what you want us to walk into. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read a verse to you in the same chapter that we just read. And uh, listen to how Moses describes the wilderness journey. The same Moses that says that God carries us as a father carries his son. Look what it says here. Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw. He describes that wilderness journey as great and as terrifying. Listen, life can be the same. And you know what? We can be honest with what we see and what we experience in life. It could be terrifying. We don't know what's next. We don't know what the next day will bring. We don't know where we're going from here. We don't know how this is going to be solved. Living by faith doesn't mean that we can't be honest. It's despite that that we believe and trust that God is with us. So as terrifying as it is, I still believe that God is holding me. But don't think that you being honest with God, with your emotions, with your circumstance, how much this terrifies you, how much this brings you to a place of question. Don't believe that that is an act of lack of faith by expressing that to God. It is an act of faith because you're expressing it to God. The fact that you're bringing it before an unseen Lord proves that you believe that he, though unseen, hears and sees you. And this is what I want us to do. We're going to sing that one more time. I need you more. I need you, Lord. But before that, before we go into that, let's just be real, okay? There are some, some of us, if not all of us, that are probably experiencing something right now, right here, and we need God to intervene. This is Bible study, yes, but it's also interaction with God. It's also believing that the God we just read about is the same God in heaven that sees us and hears us. And what we want to do is say, Lord, I need you desperately right now. I need you to guide me. I need you to give me just enough strength to go through another day. I'm in a season of waiting. I'm in a season of decision. I'm in a season of, I don't know what the season is, but I need you. I need you to intervene. I need you to intervene. And trust that God can do more than what your spiritual leaders can do. They can only do so much like Moses, but God ultimately can love, protect, and guide you even more than a Moses. Even more than a Moses. I'm going to say one final thing before we close. Maybe you heard this Bible study, but you don't know God. I have a question for you as you have stumbled upon this room. Do you know you're going to the promised land? I'm talking about heaven. Do you know for certain that you are on your way to the promised land? Because before the people can get into the promised land, the people first needed to make a covenant with God. The promised land is not a reality until you make a heart-to-heart -heart commitment to God. And that's true in the Old Testament, and the principle is the same in the New. And here it is in the New, that you will not have heaven before you make a covenant with Jesus Christ. You first have to give your heart to Jesus before your feet can enter into eternal life. My question again is, do you know that you have eternal life? And that question can only be answered if you can answer this one. Do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you know about him. I'm not even asking you to go to church. Let me shock you with this one. Many people are going to church and at the same time are going to hell. You going to church doesn't save you. You knowing Christ saves you. And this is how you are saved. Guess what? You giving your heart to God doesn't mean that you're going to promise to do everything right. 
You giving your heart to God doesn't mean that you're going to do this and do that and not do this and not do that. That is every other religion in the world. And guess what? Let me shock you again. If they don't have Christ, they're going to hell too. This is what makes our faith distinct from every other faith. That you, in coming into relationship with God, have to realize that you cannot do enough to get with this God. That your works, no matter how wonderful they may seem to your mother, to your father, to your cousins, to your family, even to yourself, will never, ever measure up to the standard of God's perfection that he requires from every single person to get into the promised land. Never. This is what it means to be a Christian. I'm too weak. I'm too sinful. And even when I feel like I'm righteous, it will never, ever impress God. The only thing that will get me into that place, the land of Canaan, the promised land, the place of flowing of milk and honey, is when you realize that Jesus lived out what you could not live out for yourself. That God, in realizing that we broke all the rules and even when we try not to, we still are a mess, lived out the life that you could not live and died the death that you and I needed to die. And he paid that price for us and he extends his mercy and says, I did it all for you. Now trust that I did it for you and believe on that basis that you're right with God. That's what it means to be Christian. <coughs> so you know what it means to be Christian? You give up. You give up trying to do it for yourself and to get God's approval. And you say, Jesus did it for me, and I give my heart to him, and I rest in that. Did you do that? If you didn't, you can sing, I need you more, with a different meaning. You can say, I need you more because I need to get saved. I need you more because I know that if you don't come and change my heart, if you do not... Save my soul tonight. I know that I don't have eternal life. That's what you can say tonight. So we're going to sing this song. Some of us are going to sing it for two different reasons. One, because we need God to intervene as his children. Two, because you need to be a child of God. And God is willing to answer both tonight. He will never reject a humble cry. That's what we're going to do as we close. So if you need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins so that you would have eternal life, you have to cry out to him, I can't do anything for you. I can only point you to the Lamb of God. But cry out to him. He's alive. He hears you. And watch, he'll be more real than you think when he changes that heart of yours. But brothers and sisters, for us who know him but need him to come in, let's just talk to him. Be honest with him. Bring it before him and believe that as you pray, you're not doing it because I'm telling you to do it. You're doing it because you really need him. Whatever you need him for. It could be victory over sin. It could be an answer to prayer. It could be financial. It could be for whatever. Ask him and believe him.